everyone. I'm really pleased you're able to join us for this CLE webinar today. First, I'm going to do some housekeeping matters. Pursuant to Utah Supreme Court rules on CLE, you have to stay for the entire hour to get credit. If for some reason you get bounced off and you're unable to get back on using your sign-in in credentials that you used the first time, like you have to sign in a second time using a phone number or something, please email me at lori. N-E-L-S-O-N at law.utah.edu and give me the updated credentials so I can make sure you get credit for the time you're on the CLE. Also, at the end and throughout the webinar, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. Please use the Q&A feature and not the chat feature. That also gives you the opportunity to like questions that you would like to see answered. So please do that. Um, now, it's my privilege to turn this over to Professor Shima Bothman, who is going to introduce the panel and the subject. And thank you all so much for being here. And thank you so much to the panelists for agreeing to do this. Thank you, Lori. Um, hi, as Lori mentioned, I'm Shima Broderon Bothman. I'm the Associate Dean of Faculty Research and Development here and a, a professor of criminal law. And I'm very excited to talk to um, our panelists, and um, especially Carissa Brian Hessick. She was a former faculty member at the University of Utah from 2013 to 2016. And since that time, she's moved to the University of North Carolina. But we definitely claim her as a, as a Utah. And as you might see or have seen by reading her book, Punishment Without Trial, why plea bargaining is a bad deal, she does feature Utah pretty prominently. And um, some of our panelists as well, as we'll, we'll learn. But let me introduce you to our um, to Professor Hessick. She serves currently as a distinguished professor of law and the director of the, the Prosecutors and Politics Project. Her teaching and research interests include criminal law, the structure of the criminal justice system, criminal sentencing, and child pornography crimes. Carissa is the author of multiple law review articles and essays and op-eds, um, on many topics, her works have appeared in top law reviews, including California Law Review, Cornell Law Review, UCLA, Virginia, among others. Um, her new book, as we talked about this punishment without crime, has been listed as a top 10 new book on Amazon in the criminal procedure area. So we're very excited to talk about it. I want to briefly introduce our other panelists. Um, Samantha Dugan, Hillary King, Grant Miller, and Liza Smith are all attorneys at the Legal Defenders Association. And Stuart Young is an assistant U.S. attorney in the District of Utah. So we're, we have our uh, defenders, we have a prosecutor here, and um, I, I Wanted to very briefly uh, talk a little bit about pre plea bargaining before we turn it over to um, Professor Hessick to kind of introduce the topic and give our other panelists a chance to speak. But one of the kind of thoughts, the prevailing, I guess, con uh, conventional wisdoms in criminal justice is that we can't have a criminal justice system without plea bargaining, right? The system would just fall apart if every case had to go to trial. Think of the numbers of uh, misdemeanors, the number of felonies that we have to process in a given year. You know, how could we process 13 million misdemeanors and 2 million felonies without having most of them, a grand majority, right, 95% or more, um, go away with plea bargaining? Well, Carissa Hessick's book really takes this notion on, this conventional wisdom, and turns it on, turns it on its head. What she says is, that's not actually the case. Um, maybe we don't need plea bargaining, uh, at least at the level that we're using it. And maybe the effects of plea bargaining uh, actually are harmful to defendants and to, to the you know, general public at large. So I'm going to, without spoiling anything else, I'm going to turn the time to, to Professor Hessig to give us you know, some discussion of the book before we go on to, to talk about some of these issues. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I was, I'm ex really excited to be here to talk to everybody about, about the book. And I actually wanted to say, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure whether she remembers this, but Professor Boffman actually um, inspired me to write this book. She and I were having a conversation back when we sat next to each other at the U 
Um, and she said that she thought um, that academics should take more initiative to inform the public about what's happening and the major challenges facing the criminal justice system. And I walked away from that conversation thinking to myself, you know what people really don't know about? They don't know about plea bargaining. I come from, I'm the first lawyer in my family. Um, I'm the only lawyer that many of them know. And when they talk to me about the criminal justice system, the picture that they paint is very different from, um, from the picture that I see when I study it. And so what I wanted to do with this book, which is written for a general audience, was to describe the, the system of plea bargaining in America, explain what it looks like now, describe some of the history of that system. That's actually the piece that, um, that lawyers um, are, are usually surprised by. Um, and then it explains how the domination of plea bargaining really, in my opinion, warps the system. Um, it's, it's sacrificed ideas like truth and justice in the name of efficiency. Um, and in doing that, I think it's, it's detrimental, not just to the interests of, of criminal defendants, but also sometimes the interests of crime victims, the interests of the general public. And it really makes the criminal justice system in large part incompatible with a system um, that's supposed to be guided by constitutional principles and provide procedural protections. So most of the book sets up the problem. It uses stories to describe the issues that I see. Um, but I wanted to do a little bit of a reading here from one of the last chapters in the books that talks about some potential solutions. And that's where many of the people who are on the panel today make an appearance in the book. So if you'll forgive me, um, I'm gonna do just a little bit of a reading. So this is from chapter nine called Possibilities for Change. Quote, if you didn't do this, then we are going to fight it. It was Liza Jones's first day in the Salt Lake County Justice Court. Her office, the Salt Lake Legal Defender Association, which represents people who are too poor to pay for their own lawyers, rotates their lawyers in and out of different courtrooms a few times a year. Liza had been working in the district court handling felony cases and class A misdemeanors, but she had handed off most of those cases to other lawyers, and now she was trying to establish a relationship with clients who had, until that morning, been represented by one of her coworkers. Liza's new client, Kevin, had been visibly upset when Liza first introduced her, herself to him. Quote, where is, where is... He seemed to be having a hard time expressing herself, himself. Where is Hillary? Liza prompted him. She still works in our office, but now she's going to be working in another courtroom. But she's told me all about your case. Kevin wore his janitor's uniform and had a look somewhere between fear and confusion on his face. Liza looked decades younger than Kevin, but Liza spoke to Kevin in a clear, confident voice, telling him about the details of his case as if to reassure him that even though she'd never met him before, she really did know everything that she needed to in order to represent him. Kevin had been accused of assaulting a neighbor when she'd inserted herself in a conversation between him and another driver who had been involved in a fender bender. The neighbor told police that she had recorded the entire incident on her cell phone, but Liza's office still hadn't received a copy of that cell phone recording. Kevin tried to tell Liza some of the background of the case, but he had a learning disability that affected his ability to communicate. Nonetheless, he was able to tell Liza that he was worried about losing his job. In particular, he was convinced that his current employer wouldn't let him stay if he was convicted, and he was especially upset because, as he said, he didn't do anything. Liza's message to Kevin that if he hadn't done anything wrong, they would fight the charges shouldn't be remarkable. But as the previous chapters of this book make clear, it is. One of the major reasons that Liza was able to tell Kevin with such confidence that they would fight the charges was the court that they were in, the Salt Lake County Justice Court. Utah's justice courts handle only Class B and Class C misdemeanors, shoplifting, prostitution, possession of marijuana, trespassing, and other low-level crimes. More serious crimes, Felonies and Class A misdemeanors are sent to district court. Justice courts are informal courts rather than formal courts of record. And so if a defendant goes to trial in a justice court and loses, he can get a brand new trial in the formal district courts. Some of the other states have similar informal courts 
but the law and the culture surrounding those courts differ from state to state. When I start, first started writing this book, I flew to Utah and spent the day with some young attorneys at the Salt Lake Legal Defenders Association, which is sometimes called LDA. I knew that plea bargaining looked different in justice court because I'd heard about those courts when I had taught on the faculty at the University of Utah a couple of years before. Some of my students got job with LDA, jobs with LDA after graduation from law school, and they would sometimes come back to campus to speak to my classes or just to say hello. Because the LDA lawyers cycle between justice court and regular district court, they were able to give me data showing the difference between trial rates in the different courts. Those statistics, which are drawn from the cases that LDA has in the courts, show a difference in the dismissal, trial, and guilty plea rates in the two courts. The trial rate is higher in justice court, and so is the dismissal rate. That is, the rate at which judges or prosecutors will dismiss charges rather than letting them proceed. Of all the cases that are filed in justice court, only 2.3% went to trial. But of the cases that were not dismissed, nearly 5% proceeded to trial. That's hardly a high number, but it's larger than the rates we see in other state courts. Data collected by the National Center for State Courts didn't have a single state with more than a 3% trial rate. And it's higher than the 2% trial rate for felony charges that are, that, that are not dismissed in Utah's district court. When I asked them about it, the young defense attorneys explained to me that there's a legitimate difference in culture and attitude in justice court. The judges and prosecutors know that there's a real chance that any given case could go to trial, and the public defenders themselves felt far more empowered to counsel their clients to proceed to trial. Importantly, while the justice court model doesn't result in a large number of trials, it results in far fewer individuals being punished without a trial. That's because prosecutors dismiss a much higher percentage of cases. More than 45% of charges were dismissed in justice court as compared to 35% of misdemeanors and 26% of felonies in the regular district courts. After spending the morning with Liza at justice court, I joined her and several of her coworkers at the LDA office for lunch. For a room full of attorneys, it was a remarkably young looking crowd. The most experienced attorney had graduated from law school only six years before, and the majority had graduated within the last three years. It was a fun, talkative crowd. They joked about which judges were better than others and offered to spell the name of one particularly disliked prosecutor in the hope that their stories of his bad behavior would be included in my book. Many of the young lawyers had spent time both in justice court and in district court, so they were able to appreciate the flexibility of the justice courts. They emphasized that the justice courts gave prosecutors far less power to pressure defendants into pleas. Several of the defenders recounted stories about how pretrial incarceration led their clients in district court to plead guilty, even though they had strong defenses. That rarely happened in justice court because most of their clients were not held in custody pending trial. Although they saw the benefits of justice court, the defenders were quick to point out some serious deficiencies in the system. For example, because the judges and prosecutors dealt only with low-level crimes, their reactions to the more serious of those crimes was sometimes overly harsh. One defender explained that a Class B misdemeanor, the most serious charge handled in, district court, in justice court, could draw a six-month jail sentence in justice court, but only a week or two in district court. The defenders were also critical of a side effect of the de novo trial system, which entitles all defendants to a new trial. It didn't result in clear reversals when justice court judges make mistakes. For example, if a justice court judge made an unconstitutional ruling and a motion to suppress evidence, the defender couldn't seek an immediate appeal of that ruling. Instead, she had to finish litigating the case in justice court, either by going to trial or pleading guilty, and then file an appeal for a new trial in district court. The district court would hear the same suppression motion and usually rule in her favor, but the favorable ruling wouldn't make clear to the district court judge, to the justice court judge, that the suppression ruling was wrong. So some justice court judges continued to make the same legal errors over and over in their rulings. The risk of legal error is even bigger outside of Salt Lake City and the other more populous areas of the state. One of the defenders, Grant Miller, who worked for a private defense attorney before joining LDA, spoke about justice courts in outlying counties where he had worked. The judges in those counties weren't even required to have a law degree. And when he showed up to represent a client in one rural county, both the prosecutor and the judge were surprised to see him. 
neither of them could remember ever seeing a defense lawyer in their county's justice court before. Even within Salt Lake City, some of the defenders saw institutional actors trying to circumvent the better procedural protections that the informality of justice court provided. For example, a defendant doesn't, usually doesn't have to begin serving a jail sentence if she files an appeal from a justice court conviction. The justice court sentence is stayed and the defendant will serve it only if she loses in district court as well. There is, however, an exception to this rule for defendants who pose a threat to public safety. If a justice court judge finds that a defendant poses a risk to public safety, then she can require the defendant to serve her sentence in jail while the appeal, while the appeal in the district court makes its way through the system. One defender, Samantha Dugan, reported that after she'd filed a large number of appeals to the district court, one, di one justice court judge suddenly started saying, that many of her clients posed public safety risks. Samantha took that as a signal from the judge that he had decided her clients should have to serve their sentences even if they eventually won in district court. In other words, the judge was exploiting a procedural loophole in order to avoid one of the protections for defendants. But overall, the LDA attorneys were proud of what they were able to accomplish in justice court. They boasted to me that one of their group, Hillary King, was undefeated in justice court though Hillary quietly corrected them, telling me she had lost one case. They explained that their ability to get a new trial in district court allowed them to be more confident and gave them a way to deal with difficult clients who wanted to fight about strategy or who unwilling to plead guilty in the face of overwhelming evidence against them. The justice court model also provides an answer to those who defend our current plea bargaining system on efficiency grounds. Rather than doing away with trials altogether, it makes trials less expensive by making them less formal. While the justice court model is more expensive than plea bargaining alone, it has the added benefit of not forcing defendants to give up their constitutional rights. Now, some historians think that the formal procedures of modern trials contributed to the rise, to the rise of guilty pleas and plea bargaining. When trials were less formal, they could be conducted relatively quickly. A single judge could hold multiple trials in a single day. Now, to be clear, there are obviously downsides to less formal trials. For example, when trials don't include a jury, then some of the benefits of having a trial are lost. But even informal trials have serious benefits. They force the parties to investigate and present evidence. As Scott Hessinger, someone who I speak about earlier in the book, observed when we met in Brooklyn, he could tell that prosecutors often hadn't really looked very closely at their cases until just before a trial was set to begin. Informal trials force prosecutors to present the evidence they have, giving defendants the chance to see that evidence and allowing someone other than the prosecutor to assess the strength of the government's case. Perhaps most important, trials, even informal trials, highlight that the goal of the criminal justice system is to figure out what happened not to simply process cases and punish defenses as defendants as efficiently as possible. And when prosecutors don't think that a conviction is worth the time and the expense of a trial, they simply dismiss the charges because pressuring the defendants into accepting a plea just isn't an option. The chapter goes on to talk about, to give some analysis about the specific benefits of, of justice court um, in terms of helping to, to revise or reform plea bargaining. One, um, is the lesson that it teaches us about the need to, to end pretrial detention, or at least the practices of pretrial detention as we have it now, where so many people are detained pretrial. Um, another example that it gives is talking about how changing the leverage changes the dynamics. And it suggests that not necessarily um, giving everyone a brand new trial if they get convicted, but reducing the consequences of that conviction can also change some of the dynamics the dynamics that, as I explain elsewhere, are problematic. So I want to go ahead and stop there um, because we have so many other people to hear from. Um, but, but thank you for allowing me to read that. And I hope, as I, as I look at the faces of the people at LDA who were nice enough to let me interview them, that I didn't get too many of the details wrong. Thank you so much. I love that introduction. And we do have a lot of panelists and, I, and I'm sure they have a lot of ideas. I think everyone's read your book. And so I, you know, want everyone to have a chance to talk about, 
you know, any of the comments you made or other types of things. I think um, what what I really felt was helpful is, you know, the, the, the tracing of the problem, but also that you provided some solutions at the end. So if that doesn't get touched on, I might um, talk a little bit about that. But let's uh, have our, anal- our uh, panelists start from, we'll have Samantha Dugan go first, maybe then Hillary King, then Liza Smith, then Grant Miller, then Stuart, Stuart Young. Those are the order that I have them. So I'll let you all take some time to talk about your, th- your thoughts about the book, any questions you have for Professor Hessick or others. And then, um, then we can just kind of answer as, as, as required, but then move on to the next panelist. So hopefully each, each one will take about, you know, five minutes or so. So we have time for everyone to, to talk. Thanks. Well, I guess just because of how the alphabet works, um, I will go first. <laughs> um, so I, I have to admit, I haven't read all of Professor Hessick's book. Um, uh, so I'm kind of honest to a fault, so I will out myself there. Um, but I, I do just sort of appreciate the idea that like the system will not crumble under the weight of itself if we don't plea bargain. Um, and I appreciate that she sort of shared our experiences in justice court, because I think as we know, justice court is very different than federal district court or um, state district court. Um, for example, I know that the AUSAs, when they are presenting cases, like they have to very much come correct um, if they are filing charges. And that's very different than what happens in in our city justice courts. Um, and so it's, it's just so interesting that there's such a disparity. Um, and I think sort of a, I don't really know how to phrase this, like a, a important care that is brought into filing charges because it seems as though in federal district court, the they understand the consequences are very high. Um, and so if the feds are charging you that, you know, <laughs> there's, there's something there. Um, it's not necessarily like justice court where um, they still have really big consequences, right? Even though we just sort of think of things as just a class B misdemeanor um, or just a DUI or even just something that could suspend your license that has really real implications for people, um, specifically folks that don't have money. Um, people who are struggling with homelessness, people with substance abuse issues, um, as well as mental illness. Um, and I love the sort of anecdote between Liza and Hillary's shared client. And I hope that they talk a little bit more about that because it's actually like a very heartwarming story and like why we do this job. Um, and sort of the way that our office tends to go above and beyond, I think, for for the folks that we represent. Um so those are sort of my thoughts <laughs> from the get-go. Um, I appreciated that Professor Hessick came and was able to follow Eliza and then to kind of sit in on one of our lunches. We were probably pretty tame for you. Usually they're a little more <laughs> like raucous. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, it's plea bargaining is just so interesting. Like that it, I spend the vast majority of my time trying to figure out um, even in, in district court like how do we do a good resolution for this person because the cost of trial is pretty high. Um, and also what if this like third degree felony retail theft just wasn't filed? Like what if we just didn't do that? Um, and so a lot of my job is sort of groveling um, and that's okay. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> but I'll turn it over to, I think the alphabet would suggest Hillary goes next. So Just to sort of echo um, what Sam is saying about the seriousness of the charges that we see in justice court, I think it is important to realize a lot of those cases come in as just a citation. So most of the time, someone's not even really being arrested or they're not things that we traditionally think of as crime in our society. So, you know, you don't have your dog's rabies vaccine or Um, you know, you don't have your dog on a leash or you got cited because you were sleeping outside. So I I think that that's where the coercive, you know, plea bargaining nature is taken out of it because, you know, most of those folks are not in jail to begin with. Whereas, you know, sometimes when you're meeting people on a more serious charge, their priority is rent is due. You're telling me if I plead guilty, I'm out tomorrow, I will plead guilty. So, you know, I think that's kind of an added um, sort of feature. Um, And furthermore, because it is these, you know, mass citations coming in, 
um, to put it bluntly, a lot of garbage gets filed. Um, and we sort of sort through that and try to decide, you know, what, what is worth a plea versus, you know, if it, if it's something more minor, as the book points out, there really are not a lot of risks in going to trial and losing these cases because in our justice courts, we do get an automatic do-over. So you can kind of change the calculus the next time, it, you know, if your theory didn't work out, um, if there's a, a fact that you think you can't get over in a subsequent trial. Um, I will save the story for Liza because she tied it up in a nice little bow and got the happy ending. But to kind of set the, the tone um, for Kevin, um, so as the book mentions, he did have a learning disability. I can't remember exactly what was going on with him, but you know, he couldn't read or write. Um, and this is the first time he had ever been in trouble. I don't even think the guy had a traffic ticket or any police interactions prior in his life. And so, you know, he gets cited for an assault and he comes in very scared, um, you know, just based on his disabilities. I think a lot of people have treated him differently in life. And I could just tell, you know, regardless of what the video, the cell phone video showed, this is a guy who needs a little extra handholding. Um, he worked for a school district. And, you know, I remember he came in on the first day of court and he had a letter and he didn't even know what it said. Um, he asked me to read it to him. I ended up going to the school board um, to help uh, kind of field um, the consequences. Ultimately, he was able to keep his job, which Liza will talk about. Um, but, you know, it, we just see everyday people um, like that. And I think it's a, it's a really big deal um, because most of these people you know, have never been in trouble before. This is their first and probably the only interaction they're going to have with the criminal justice system. Um, and in in that regard, there's a lot of handholding that goes on that doesn't necessarily pop up in these, you know, serious felony district court cases where, frankly, ultimately the goal in those felony cases is how do we make this person not a felon? Um, and sometimes that means pleading to the misdemeanor they throw our way. Um, but those are just some, some thoughts. So I'll turn it over to Liza. I'll, I'll follow up on what Hillary said. I think that, um, Kevin's story is a perfect example of the collateral consequences that come along with, um, with not only just being charged, but also with taking plea deals, um, that you have to take into consideration the other impacts that it has on an individual's life besides, the basic, you know, sentencing that we're going to see there, be it jail time or probation, um, you know, there, there are large um, impact of um, immigration consequences, as well as employment. And Kevin was certainly the example where um, both Hillary and myself felt that any other sort of resolution in this matter um, was going to result in an unjust, um, an unjust finding for him. Um, and I think too, what's noted is, I mean, we do have, we've all handled, you know, hundreds of cases at this point, but there are certainly those individuals that stick with you. And, um, I also appreciate that Kevin was the anecdote used here because, um, he is one who stuck with us. Uh, Hillary did a lot of community-based work with him beforehand, which I think is why it was shocking to him when, um, when he was handed off to myself, I know that she went and um, addressed him, you know, at a, a school board, went and addressed the school board at, at a, a meeting for him. Um, and ultimately it came down to an issue related to evidence, right? Where by setting it for trial, the, the cell phone recording that had not previously been made available to us um, needed to be provided in the discovery process. And the viewing of that revealed that, uh, the individual who was claiming that she was assaulted was really more of the nosy neighbor who in fact it appeared had maybe assaulted Kevin in getting her cell phone in his face and video recording him. And because of his learning disabilities and the perceptions that he had in his reaction to that, she felt that she had been 
assaulted and was more able to effectively communicate that. Um, and so those charges were brought against him. Kevin's case was fortunately one of those cases that once we had that evidence and um, was able to really evaluate the case with the prosecutor that they agreed, um, they dismissed the case before we went to trial after the trial date was set. And um, we were able to provide verification to Kevin's employer so that he was able to keep that job. But I do think that that's a big difference between um, both district court and justice court. One that we, there are still collateral consequences, major collateral consequences in district court, but those are ones that we often come to expect with the nature of the charges. And when we're making decisions about how to most effectively resolve them, as Sam said, you know, doing some groveling to get what we need there to have the ultimate best resolution for our client, which is not always trial. But in justice court, those sorts of impacts are much larger and more pervasive when you're looking at the relation to the level of offense that is there. Um, and I think just the unique nature of LDA and how we represent our clients as well, we, we do rotate through um, back and forth from addressing class A misdemeanors in, um, in district court and coming back down into justice court. And particularly when you are able to come back into justice court after rotation in district court, it really highlights for you the distinctions and the disparity in how those cases are handled. And it certainly bolsters us um, to make more aggressive decisions for our clients and to encourage them to take those to trial. And that's unique, I think, in any other area of practice or or for any private attorney probably as well who handles matters in um, in both of those courts that the juxtaposition of the two is uh, is eye opening in what those consequences are. Um, so those are my thoughts and I'll leave that there. But thank you, Professor Hessek, for um, for highlighting Kevin's story and for allowing us this opportunity as well to to talk about this because I know it's something we're all passionate about. Suppose alphabetically I'm up. <laughs> um, I want to plug the book. It's a, it's a really good book. Uh, I, uh, I I didn't know, I, we, we got interviewed for the book. I, I didn't know when it was released. Uh, uh, Professor Hessig actually reached out for us to this panel. I'm like, oh, shoot, the book's out. And so I got it. My first knee-jerk reaction was, why plea bargaining is a bad deal? And I immediately I had a visceral reaction. I'm like, hold on, plea bargaining is part of the system. Uh, it, it's, it's, you know, you don't have very many levers as a, as a criminal defense lawyer. And, and it's one of the margins where you could actually do something beneficial or just for your client. And so I'm like, you know, I was, had some trepidation going into it, but uh, the book is really good about covering all four corners of, of the issues and really lit a fire, um, that I, I hadn't realized it started to, to dwindle inside of me about the importance of, uh, of, of trial really being the default democratic right of, uh, of everybody. In the country, I mean, like uh, you know, you get to be a public defender for a second, you get tired of doing what we call brown bagger trials. The uh, trials with the facts so bad, you have to wear a, a brown bag over your head at, uh, in front of a jury to maintain your dignity. Um, and uh, you know, I, I started to burn out on those um, because clients would be like, "I want to take this to trial." I'm like, "You're out of your mind!" And then you go to the prosecutor, they're like, "Setting a trial." They're like, "Why?" Um, and, and so I'd get frustrated. But after reading this book, I, I kind of went back into the courtroom and just started uh, uh, a wholesale setting trials again. Um, because it reminded me that like, no, this is, um, you know, on top of being able to have the right to vote, what's more important, I think, and then the book covers this is, is in the country's founding documents, um, that it's the people that determine uh, liberty interests, um, that, that, that prosecutors who work for the state or, or, or judges that are appointed by the governor or the federal system, the president, they don't even have that power to deprive liberty, that the deprivations of due process can only be derived from the people. It's a very core principle, and that can't diminish uh, from our culture because it's something that gives uh, gives our country such a such a strong foundation. Um, and uh, uh, reading this book kind of gave me a very patriotic bent, um, and uh, I'm really happy uh, that uh, you, you made this happen, Professor Hasek. I really recommend. Uh, anyone, it's 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 not a terribly long read. It's a really accessible book. Uh, make sure that you you, you get it and, and you review it. I think it brings up some very uh, very meaningful points of uh, where we're at the legal system in this country uh, and um, and the remedies. It's not. You know, at first, I thought I argued that we should do trials every time, which I thought was uh, was a dangerous proposition. It doesn't argue that. It just says that we need to temper 
um, the the direction of uh, of this bureaucratic process of just pleading people out and and, and counterbalance it. Uh, so we maintain that system of justice, and I think that's a very fair point. And I think that it's something that needs to be better reflected uh, in policy reforms moving forward. Uh, so thank you, Professor. Thank you for having me. All right, I think it's my turn. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for having me on the panel. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, have a token prosecutor uh, with four defense counsel uh, on on this. Um, I also want to just uh, give the caveat that uh, I am not rep representing the Department of Justice, although I have a bunch of seals behind me that make it look like I am representing the Department of Justice. I am only speaking in my personal capacity. That's once I give that caveat, they actually let me speak about these kind of things. Uh, I think I may surprise people just a little bit. I really like this book. Uh, and I and and it's not just because it's well written. Uh, Professor Hessek uh, knows how to turn a phrase, uh, and and writes very well. Uh, I I um, I really appreciated a number of the points. Now I I have some disagreement with some of them, but I really appreciated uh, her approach uh, to this topic, and I and I thought it was fascinating. Uh, I'm a failed academic, and I really appreciate it when we have very good law professors like Professor Hessek actually get into the trenches and talk to the people who are doing the work. A lot of academics sit in their ivory tower and, you know, and pontificate about things, but Professor Hessek really did the work, interviewed a lot of people from, you know, from Brooklyn to Salt Lake to judges around the country. Uh, and uh, and so I really appreciate her approach to this. Uh, and uh, and and I also uh, Professor Boffman is very similar. She does a lot of empirical research and does a very good job kind of going through going through the numbers rather than just kind of, you know, reading art, reading, uh, reading cases and pontificating uh, about cases. So I really appreciate the academic approach by both Professor Hessek and, and Professor Boffman uh, on criminal subjects. I will say. Um, you know the the reading through it, and uh, and I and I got through a number of chapters. I didn't. I confess I didn't finish the whole thing, but uh, I really like chapter seven. I really like chapter eight and chapter nine, especially and um, especially the Epstein part. We were talking about Epstein and and whatnot. Um, and what what's fascinating actually is that Professor Hessek talks about a lot of things that we do in federal court, uh, uh, and. Uh, in, in terms of, um, I, I guess the, the best way to put it is, as I read through this book, I realized that maybe I'm a little bit of part of the problem. And, and here's what I mean by that. Uh, for instance, uh, in, uh, in federal court, I generally do kind of large scale gang cases, you know, 25, 30 defendants, wiretaps. So we, you know, we, we provide the discovery within one week. So we don't have the same issue that you would have with Kevin uh, at LDA, where you don't get the cell phone video until, right, you know, until you set up for trial. I mean, we're supposed to set it, you know, we're, we have to give this discovery over within, you know, within weeks or uh, of the charge usually. Um, but, uh, but oftentimes I will have defense counsel come up to me and they will say, uh, my client has 17 pending cases in justice court. Uh, can we do a global resolution? Let's say he pleads to seven years in federal court uh, and, you know, and you guys can talk to the prosecutor and get all of those dismissed. Uh, you know, and, and so, so our, you know, our, uh, we do this quite a lot. And so we, I think our federal court is somewhat responsible for some of these dismissals uh, and not getting people the opportunity to, to have their day in court, to have their trial, whether, you know, if there's a victim involved or, uh, or you know, there's a bad, bad police officer who's, who's done something improper, you can't suss that out. Um, I will say this too, I really appreciated the approach by Professor Hessek uh, talking about having more trials. And I'm all for having more trials. In fact, um, I, I am very much in favor of anytime a defense counsel really wants to have a trial, let's have a trial. Our problem is we have some fairly severe mandatory minimums, and so um, and so what what I anticipate is possibly with this administration, 
uh, you know, lessening those mandatory minimums or eliminating them. Uh, you know, I'm not so sure there would be more trials with that, however. Uh, and what, because there have been a number of times where I've offered to a defense counsel, hey, look, let's pull the man in, let's just go to trial. You know, you know, he'll get sentenced, whatever the sentence is, but it's not going to be subject to man men. I've never been taken up on that, not once in my 15 year career. Uh, so, and, and I haven't done that in every case. I mean, there's certain kingpins that I, you know, I'm not interested in, in doing that, but I, I do, I do, I have offered that sometimes. And I was looking on this, uh, this panel attendee list. I don't see anybody from our federal CJA panel, uh, but, you know, but that, that is sometimes an option that we do offer and, you know, and, and people generally still consider the federal sentencing guidelines so draconian that they just don't want to even take that chance. They just want kind of a negotiated plea. Uh, you know, and so I, I recognize uh, the concerns in the system. I really appreciate Professor Hessick's approach. Uh, and I, I really enjoy the book. And I'm glad there's a book out there that, that, that can talk about these things. A number of the, again, a number of the things that she, that there are complaints about, at least in the Salt Lake Federal District Court, we We've kind of eliminated some of those things. We don't have cash bail. You know, we have either, you know, OR or detention. You know, I mean, there's there's some, you know, certain things like that. But I, I really think uh, in terms of getting a dialogue going about criminal justice reform, uh, this is this is an excellent uh, discussion that, that Professor Hessick has brought to the table. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of our um, distinguished pa panelists. I love all of the unique perspectives you provide and all of your great experience. Um, you know, before we kind of take some questions from the audience, I wanted uh, to allow Professor Hessek the opportunity to discuss, if she wants, um, some of the proposed, you know, kind of remedies, at least ideas. I know you, you know, in the conclusion and kind of possibilities for change section, I thought there were some interesting ones. And one I thought, you know, it would be neat to talk about to see if there's any traction since her book is um, there were a couple of jurisdictions. Uh, she, she talked about Alaska and pa El Paso, where they attempted to um, uh, prohibit plea bargaining where, and then it was reversed, but um, she talked about how that in itself was, was effective. And something I've seen actually just in some comparative work abroad is, um, you know, some common law jurisdictions like the UK and other common law countries don't allow plea bargaining. And so um, because of that, there has to be, you know, it's almost done secretly or it's done in a way, I mean, it happens, but it's, um, it's done in a more careful way. So I'm curious if, you know, you, you want to talk about that piece or any of the other recommended, you know, possibilities for change you want to talk about before we take on questions. Sure. Yeah. So the, the idea of banning plea bargaining um, is, you know, I, I definitely hear other academics and sort of think tank folks talk about it. And, and I don't think that that's the right solution. And there's sort of a, a few reasons. There's sort of the, the pragmatic reason, which is, um, as, as Professor Boffman just indicated, um, it's, it's easy to get around these sorts of bans, right? And things would be done in secret. So saying we're going to ban plea bargaining isn't necessarily going to get rid of plea bargaining. So I just don't think that it would be effective. But in addition to that, um, uh, and this is sort of, I suppose, the, the depressing part of the book, um, I think that plea bargaining is one problem with the modern criminal justice system, but it's not the only problem. And if we, um, if we don't pay attention to how much we've changed our system because the default resolution mechanism is plea bargaining, then I think we, we do a real disservice. A lot of the mandatory minimums that Mr. Young mentioned exist because um, we want prosecutors to have leverage in plea bargaining. So if you take away plea bargaining and you're left with the mandatory minimum sentences, then you actually have people going to jail for longer periods of time than the folks in Congress or in the state legislature thought was necessary, right? There's, um, I talk about this a bit in the book, um, but to the extent that Congress thinks that a five, years a five year mandatory minimum is supposed to be there to encourage people to cooperate, that they don't think it's necessary for most people who have a certain amount of drugs to spend five years in prison, then putting all of those people in prison for five years is itself a problem. I also think that more fundamentally, we need to think about things like 
mandatory sentencing systems, which I understand in the wake of the Supreme Court's decisions in Blakely and Booker aren't really supposed to be mandatory anymore. But in a lot of places in practice, they are mandatory, right? Or they've come up with sort of post-Blakely fixes to make them mandatory once again. If you have those mandatory sentencing systems, then again, the same sort of problems that you see with mandatory minimums arise. We'd have to rethink the way we approach drafting criminal codes and setting sentences in a system where we're not supposed to have plea bargaining in order for that to work. And then the last piece of this, and I I feel bad that I haven't said this up until now, is I know that it's very fashionable right now to blame prosecutors and the legislature, so the executive and the legislative branch for all of the ills of the modern criminal justice system. But I play, I'm willing to, and I think we all should, place a decent amount of blame with the judiciary and not just the Supreme Court for failing to do anything about due process rights and the right to a jury trial, but to the, to the thousands of judges across the country who are openly willing to admit that even if the prosecutor isn't going to charge a sentence with a mandatory minimum, they will impose a trial penalty on those defendants who go to trial. So I think that there is an awful lot that needs to change in addition to plea bargaining and just sort of pulling plea bargaining out. It doesn't I was going to make a Jenga analogy, but maybe that's not right because it doesn't knock the whole tower tower over, but it might make it lean even worse in certain directions. Great. Thank you for those thoughts. We have some questions uh, in about 10 minutes or so. So I'm going to, you know, pose the question and then whoever wants to answer it, feel free to comment. Of course, we'll let Professor Hesek give comments if she wants. Um, The first question is, my experience defending criminal defendants is that over 90% of those getting a plea bargain end up violating the agreement and consequentially are stuck with a guilty conviction. What are the statistics of plea bargains ending up being violated? Anyone want to take that one? if there are hard numbers that I'm aware of that uh, sort of show like people violating plea agreements, I think the sort of number one part of plea agreements is like you're pleading guilty, right? Unless it's a plea in abeyance agreement where you do in fact plead guilty, but then contingent upon sort of following the agreement that you have with the state, then the case will be dismissed like it didn't happen. Um, I would say a lot of folks violate plea agreements like while they're on probation but my thing always is why like why are people violating is it is it because they have a substance use disorder that we haven't dealt with are they not taking medications for mental illness um do they not have a house to live in because it's like pretty hard to comply with probation if you are concerned about being raped and murdered and robbed um while you're sleeping on the street um and so i think it's sort of defense attorneys jobs to educate judges um, and to some extent prosecutors about what's happening in your client's life to explain like, okay, they didn't check in this day, but they did follow up the the next week because they finally got a, a, what my clients always call the Obama phone. Um, And so they did follow up a week later. And so like, that's not a violation. Right. Um, And it really sort of depends on who the judge is, like what they're going to, believe I should say. Um, But I will say in my experience, like the district court judges are way more understanding than a lot of the justice court judges. Um, A lot of justice court judges are like, well, you should have done this. And it's like, why man, it's a class C in talks. Like why, why are we going to put someone in jail for three days because they didn't follow up because they're homeless? Like why? Um, So that maybe didn't like fully answer your question. But in my experience, yeah, a lot of people violate plea agreements. Um, but I also have a lot of people who successfully complete um, and success looks different to each person. And that's kind of my specialty court bent. I'm in mental health court as well. Um, and so I try to bring that into my practice, not in specialty courts. I would also just say that um, one violation doesn't necessarily mean that someone is unsuccessful or that they're technically being closed unsuccessful. Um, You know, lots of people do have pretty minor hiccups, for example, a relapse or a single missed appointment that later gets remedied, like Sam had mentioned. 
And, um, you know, a lot of times as lawyers, we really only see someone if there's a problem and it's not brought to our attention if there's not a problem. Um, but I, I would just say anecdotally, I, I've had many clients that I never see again, which means they've successfully closed or there's been a minor issue at the beginning that is addressed and ultimately, you know, they complete their probation successfully and they get the benefit of their deal, whether that be a dismissal or a reduced conviction or, um, you know, they get to go on living their lives and they're not having to serve jail or prison time for violation. Um, but yeah, that, that's just my experience. But again, I don't know that we, we keep data on how many violations there are. I think that it's something that the administrative office of the court might hold data on, but I've never seen it. And it, it's really hard to collect data on, on, on technical probation violations uh, just because of the rapidity and, and, and vast amount of it. Um, but there is a theme here um, that, uh, you know, it, it's scary when you plead someone in and, and they're anticipated almost to, uh, you know, automatically violate probation and and while sanctions are suspended up front they're going to almost certainly come back if they're going to violate uh but the thing here though is that defendants need structure and and the more structure they have from their attorneys and from the system the more successful they're going to be moving through the system uh and so for the other criminal practitioners out there and i, I think this question came from a pra criminal practitioner is uh, always always believe in your clients and help them uh, I know that some people have the practice of uh, wanting to hop off a case after a, after a case resolves with a plea. Um, and, and I'd ask my colleagues not to do that, uh, to, to, to keep, keep, keep that structure with their clients and take care of them until the case is truly closed. Uh, because without that, it's, if, if someone doesn't have that, that Obama phone or that lifeline to help them navigate what's a really bureaucratic and, and draconian system, then they're going to fail. Um, and so part of that failure, I think, uh, is incumbent on us, uh, regardless of our position in the system, to try to help people through it. Thank you. OK, I'm going to ask a couple more questions from another person who's read your book, um, Professor Hessig. He says one of the suggestions in the book was waiving a defendant's appearance at scheduling conferences. But as a prosecutor often appears that the defendant doesn't have any conversations with their attorney except at the hearings. So would that would waiving defendant's appearance have a detrimental impact on attorney client contact? So that's a question for you, Professor. Isaac. And then uh, for the other attorneys in the room, um, in the context of COVID halting many trials while simultaneously empowering remote appearances, what impacts of COVID protocols have the LDA attorneys seen on plea deals? So I'll just say really quickly, um, I have no doubt that um, that. Uh, it seems as though those appearances are are helpful to the defendant from the outside, right? I mean, I think I think some judges want to actually check up on the defendants, and that's why they make them show up at those hearings. They want to make sure that they are going to show up, and they take them not showing up as a sign that they're somehow off track. I I defer to the LDA folks here on the on the call, but I I imagine that they have other ways of contacting their clients, or they could easily organize those ways of doing it that wouldn't raise the same sorts of problems in terms of the, um, the costs and the inconvenience to clients for having to show up at those court dates, not to mention the possibility of potentially being incarcerated if they aren't able to show up, but I'd, I'd defer to them on that question. I will just say, I think that we do have many other avenues to have contact with our client. There's certainly a benefit, right? When they make their initial appearance, um, particularly when they're receiving court-appointed counsel, they submit an affidavit that demonstrates their eligibility and contact information is able to be provided then. So I think there's a benefit to having them come for that first hearing, which is really an information gathering hearing and letting them know when their next process is. But there are many subsequent hearings that follow that that are you know, waiting for discovery issues to be resolved. Um, if there are negotiations, negotiations that continue to happen, particularly pre-COVID, having our clients need to take the time off work or find childcare um, or any other number of issues in order to come and sit all morning um, to wait for their hearing to be called and three minutes later continued certainly has an an ongoing detrimental impact, which I think that you emphasized, um, Professor Hessek. And so in those during that interim period, um, 
we have ways to have those conversations. And I think that with COVID, um, that's further emphasized that because we now are conducting all of our hearings online. We don't ever get to meet with our clients in person, in court. And um, it's taken some adaptation on our part to, you know, play a, a bit of a an investigator role in tracking down some clients when that initial contact information is not available. But we've been able to have contact with them in between hearings um, and, and in order to negotiate that. I think the the larger impact that it's had on us is has actually been our negotiation process with prosecutors um, and the delays that we've seen in that because of COVID protocols um, with being able to communicate with prosecutors and not so much our clients in between hearing dates. Whereas a lot of the negotiations that we um, used to have in that respect could happen in the courtroom with a, a quick back and forth. And now it takes, you know, quite an extended period if there's not an immediate agreement and any sort of back and forth in order to make those connections and then connect with our clients, that it results in a lot of additional hearings that quite frankly, it would be um, beneficial for our clients to not have to show up even over video. But um, I think that there are ways for us to to have that contact in in the meantime with clients that it, it benefits them and takes away some of those other, again, collateral consequences of taking the time off to come to court. Um, just to add, add in on that, I will say this, if, if there could be any, you know, benefits we could say about what COVID has done to our courts, um, it has made the judges a lot more flexible in terms of what we can continue off of the calendar. Um, you know, there is a lot of negotiating that happens in between hearings. And if we don't quite have something worked out, a lot of judges are open to us just emailing and saying, we need a little more time. Can we just continue this? So it does kind of take the, the inconvenience of waiting for three hours for a, a 30 second hearing out of that. Um, and then in terms of the, the negotiations with prosecutors to answer Will's second question, I could talk about this all day. Feel free to email me. Um, but I think our prosecutor's office is kind of going through a unique time right now where a lot of folks have left their office for one reason or another. And so a lot of those prosecutors have way more of a caseload than um, was normal when we were having everyone in the courtroom meeting face to face and negotiating cases during, you know, court times. Um, and also, you know, all attorneys on both sides are kind of notorious for being slow to respond to emails. So adding that into the negotiation process, you know, what previously took 15 minutes in court now takes, you know, days um, of back and forth. And then sometimes with the added factor of our clients don't always have reliable phone numbers or you know, sometimes their bill doesn't get paid, so their phone gets shut off, or they change numbers and they forget to update us. That also, you know, kind of slows down the negotiating that was able to happen in a much more condensed face-to-face -face manner before. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of our panelists. Professor Hessek, thank you for letting us read your amazing book and talk about it. It's not coming out with my, there you go. <laughs> um, and thank you for all the insights that we've gained from the Salt Lake City audience. And thanks for all that, uh, the people that participated. We appreciate it and um, hope everyone has a great weekend.